Welcome to the Manitoba Ag Days podcast, where we hear from some of the most relevant, up-to-date, informational speakers in our industry. In episode 37, Colin Rossengren, producer from Middale, Saskatchewan, shares his story, cash cropping with intercrops. All right. Um, thank you guys for having me here. I'm just wondering, show of hands, how many, it's an organic presentation, how many here are organic farmers? Most of you. Okay. How many of you are using intercropping practices? A few of you? Okay. Yeah, quite a few. Good. All right. So I'm just going to tell you today a little bit about, uh, walk through sort of uh, some of the reasons why we started intercropping, uh, some of the basic theory behind it, why I think it makes a lot of sense, and then some of the attributes and logistics and, and things that we've been able to make work and just kind of hopefully provide you guys with a little... Um, enthusiasm or incentive to, to go home and try some things as well. So I guess the first question is, is uh, early on in intercropping, I always, the very first question that always came is, why are you doing that? Why does somebody do that? And now we've been at it enough and there's enough people doing it and enough research behind it that basically the question that I tend to ask back to them is why they're not. Um, and a lot of those reasons really comes down to automation, scale, I mean, they'll tell you gains in efficiency, um, these are the type of things that they'll feed back in answers. Um, one big thing that comes back to me, really one answer the hits that they like to say is they've always done it that way. So I like to show them this slide and say, yeah, here's a cave drawing showing that this is how we've always farmed, right? <laughs> in reality, it's not. Before we were even in North America, the natives were, were harvesting, where they were using corn, beans, and squash. They called them three sisters. Um, other areas of the world, anywhere before automation and before fertilizers and chemicals, before the tools were available, basically, they were intercropping. It was the only sustainable way that they could actually grow crops and produce food. So automation came along, though, and obviously with early equipment, wasn't going to be capable to harvest the way we were when you were doing it by hand. It was very different, going to present more challenges, and so the system moved towards monoculture and uh, went towards scale and larger. Tools came along, chemicals, fertilizers, things to solve our problems. There was always something available uh, to any problem that came up could be solved and somebody would have something to sell you. And you can still walk around the show today for any product that's out there. Any, any problem you have, someone will have something to sell you to fix it. So there's always a solution. Um, some of those tools, oh, that was not backwards. There we go. Resistance is showing up to chemicals. Um, so they do have a life proper herbicide rotations will extend that life of those tools, but it doesn't, it doesn't eliminate it. So there, there's going to be a life to where they're not going to work anymore. So if we don't change our direction, um, we're going to end up where we're headed. So these tools are going to run out. We're seeing it in animal agriculture with antimicrobial resistance showing up. Certain drugs don't work anymore. We're very familiar with that. Certain chemicals don't work anymore. Group twos on kochia or are pretty much a waste of time in, in the vast majority of the prairies right now. So now that I sound like a very uh, negative, dismal, uh, this is the end of, of agriculture for us, that's not really the case and it's not usually my viewpoint on anything either. I'm pretty optimistic and, and looking forward. So there are a lot of good tools and that's what we're going to discuss is some of them here. So this is some of the reasons why we intercrop. And as our own farm managers, we, we need to go beyond the products that they're selling us and figure out what the best tools are for us because the ones that don't cost us anything there's nobody going to be standing at a booth and selling them to us so it's up to us to figure those out so in 2004 when we started intercropping i mean it was purely about the interspecific phosphorus mobile no um, 2004 the margins were terrible there was no money in agriculture it was it was purely trying to reduce input costs and increase our production, increase our net returns per acre. I mean, that was the straight driver behind it. There are a lot of good things that happen through it. So when we start looking at intercropping, um, when we look at nature, God intercrops. When we take a look, there, there's no monoculture in nature. It's not a natural system. If you leave your land alone, it doesn't all go to one species. It doesn't migrate that way. It migrates towards uh, a mixed polycultural system. So it makes sense from that perspective. When we take a look at diseases, um, insects, anything that we're battling in the field, there's a disease triangle, they call it. So we have environment, host, and pathogen. So the big thing right now in agriculture, generally we focus right here. 
we focus between the crop and, the, and that pest and we come in here and we buy products and we buy products and try and break this. But what I'm saying we can do agronomically ourselves uh, as growers is we can affect this, we can affect the environment down here. We can't do much about the environment up here really. Um, a little bit by creating different crop canopies, different seeding timing, all those things. We can, we can change the odds of that environment, but if it's going to be really wet or really dry or whatever, we can't affect that a huge amount. We can affect our, our soils for our root environment, and we can affect this difference here between the environment and the, and the pathogen by changing, changing um, the crop canopies, the timings, those type of things. We can also change our host by creating mixed crops. Uh, we can change that host. If it's a monoculture, obviously the insects will prefer that, and we'll show some of that later in other slides. Where'd my next one go? There we go. Um, also, weed control. So when we look at weeds, this, this chart was actually, uh, it was developed in Sweden, I think, and it's hard to read, but it doesn't matter much. The point is, these rates along the outside were actually supposed to be your herbicide application rate. And it was saying, if your crop is off to a vigorous start, then this is the rates you need to apply. High weed density, low weed, medium weed density. Um, if your crop's off to a poor start, the numbers, your application rates are, are going to have to be a lot higher than if your crop's a good start. It's all these logical things that, especially as organic farmers, you guys know these because seeding rates, seeding timings, all these things are things that you guys are better at than, than the rest of uh, general farmers because you have to be, because you don't have these options, you don't have these tools. Um, certainly we can see this is, a, this is an intercrop here of canola, peas and lentils. And you can start to see the, how thick that canopy is. So things like light use efficiency, just, just blocking that sunlight from hitting the soil is going to stop that next flush of weeds from coming, creating that extra competition. Um, what are optimum seeding rates? Optimum seeding rates with a monoculture is based on things that are like, why do you stop at a certain seeding rate? It's because you're going to run into lodging, you're going to run into disease, you're going to run into a problem. So that's why you stop at that optimum rate. If you mix your crops, that new optimum rate is a higher plant density. So you can gain that extra competitiveness of the crop without increasing the disease problems or without increasing pest problems. So you can compete with weeds a lot better. So the basic theory works um, for mixing crops. It makes sense. It helps us battle the battles that we're fighting. Um, helps us work with nature a little bit more instead of fighting against some of it. So now let's talk about what has worked and what hasn't worked. So I'll run through a lot of the things we've tried over the years. Um, we've tried a lot of things. Some have worked well. Some haven't worked as well. Um, this is pea canola lentil. So there's three of them here. In this particular picture, I, and I just, I always put this picture in. I like it. This is not an example of one that worked particularly well. It still worked, but not as good. So we started with pea canola, the same as, as U of M had done the research. It looks like the easiest most no-brainer one. Substitute mustard for canola if you want. It makes no difference. Um, the crop works really well together. General starting point, we do two-thirds the seeding rate of each crop. When it's two crops, half the seeding rate of each. When it's three crops, um, fertilizer rates were, were much reduced in there, especially nitrogen. We'd keep our FOSS levels up, but, but our nitrogen requirements were dropped just to the point of getting enough to start the crop and then let the rhizobium kick in. Um, in this case, what we tried to do this year was uh, we put down, in this particular year, not this last year, but the canola rows, we put fertilizer down the point. So we put a higher rate of nitrogen right down the point in this row and then seeded canola out the paired row. And then on these rows, we put down the, the peas and the lentils with the phosphorus. So it was what we were capable of doing and we thought we were hoping we could bias the nitrogen towards that canola and not to the peas and we, we thought we could increase yield. In the end, it wasn't really any benefit. It was, it was probably a negative versus having a mixed rose, which later we found more research. Um, when I was reading some studies that had been done, the mixed rows and that root interaction is really a key feature to making it work. And so generally now, we've, we've all gone to mixing the rows of, of any crops that we're growing. This is one we tried with flax. Um, we did some playing with flax. And the main reason we've been playing around with flax in different cropping systems is because uh, our area has really low phosphorus availability and so flax crops are 20 to 25 bushels an acre is all a guy seems to ever be able to grow. Um, you can't, uh, flax is really terrible at taking up fertilizer phosphorus so 
it has to be stuff that's in the soil. And so our soils are low and production is limited. So when we intercrop flax, we often get as good a yield with something else as it does on its own. Um, sometimes even better, and we'll talk about that in a different mix. So this crop, we actually tried flax, and we, we called it relay seeding, but we, um, or stagger cropping, I guess is what we called it, but we haven't ever done it again. So, But we seeded the flax crop, and then we went back in later, about a month later, and we seeded flax again. You can see it coming, and then at this stage, the late stuff is flowering. Um, I wished I had done a little lower rate the first time and heavier the second, but to try to get it better, we got about a 10% boost, and it's about, you probably see about 10% extra flowers there after the fact. So, but the basic theory, what we were trying to do was extend that growing season and, and take advantage of a longer period of nutrient uptake and water use and sunlight use, and basically turn a flax crop into, uh, instead of being a 100 day crop, trying to make it sort of a 130 day crop. Um, so when the original crop, when the first one's done using moisture and drying down, the second one would, second stage would be filling. So it was trying to take advantage of, of rains in a dry area and, and get extra yield. And we got a little bit, but um, PASMO is a disease that's, that's kind of a problem in monoculture flax. And so extending that season also extended the disease pressure, I think. So it probably didn't work as well as, as putting a complete different crop with the flax. We've had more success. Uh, flax and corn was one. Um, the first year we, we seeded some corn with uh, air drill and it was quite disastrous because it goes down the tubes and you get six plants here and then you have a, a gap of 10 feet before there's three or four more plants and so it wasn't pretty. So we decided, got thinking we'd spent this money on corn seed and, and didn't really want to go and spray it out to seed the next crop. So we said, what can we put with it and leave the corn there and grow something else besides? Um, it's Roundup Ready corn, so we could burn the field off anyway. All that was left was corn, so we seeded flax into some, we seeded soybeans into some, and uh, just as an experiment, we left a, left a strip as well, so we'd have comparative ways of uh, measuring our yields and the impact. So the corn flax um, that year was, was exceptional. The corn grew up nice and tall. The flax came in flowering underneath. As I mentioned, the corn was fairly thin anyway. Um, it did really good. The corn ran about 60 and the flax ran 20 underneath it, so we were pretty happy with it. Combined, excellent. Um, anytime we have a crop like chickpeas or corn or something with the flax, it really helps to thrash it. So normally you gotta set your rotor really tight to get all those flax balls thrashed. Corn cobs did a, did a really good job. There's no flax balls in the sample at all. The corn just rolled it all right out of there. My combine didn't have to do the work the corn did. Um, Oh yeah, I'll just go back. So the next year we thought corn flax was so good, we thought, okay, but I'm not, I don't want to seed it twice. I want to do this all in one pass. So we did, and that was a complete wreck, other than a very good tuition, I guess, and learning experience. So from that we learned that it basically, you've got to take into account the timing of these crops and their competitive stages. So the first year the corn was, was about that tall when we seeded the flax into it, so it was fine. Everything was good all along. The next year when we seeded at the same time, the flax came up more aggressive, um, grew over top of the corn, so at the time the flax was flowering, it, was, it was, uh, looked like a flax crop, looked really good, uh, and the corn was down in the canopy. Unfortunately, the corn was struggling right then because it was being outcompeted, and that's the stage when it decided how big a cob it should try and make. So it decided this is a tough situation. I'm going to make a corn cob about that big because this is not good. And then we got a nice rain, and and the corn just shot up above that flax and spread its leaves and I thought, oh wow, this is going to work good. That corn looks amazing. Um, meanwhile, the flax was sitting underneath there trying to fill the flax balls and the corn was just at its, at its height of resource utilization. So it's using all the moisture and all the sunlight and the flax is trying to fill. So the flax balls didn't fill and then the corn grew all kinds of tons of material with uh, no cobs on it. So in the end we had about 10 tons of of uh, corn stover and flax straw to hammer through the combines for less than 20 bushels an acre. So it was not good. So the next time we went back to it, we made sure we seeded it in two stages and same thing, it was repeatable. So very, very dramatic. We don't need replicated trials to prove that to us. And it really highlighted to me that we need to know the competitiveness of the crop and the stages when each crop needs its resources. And at the stages where it doesn't need its resources, if we can design another crop to come in, and take advantage at that stage, then that helps because then the weeds aren't going to do that or something else isn't going to do that. So if we can design our crops to, to balance and use things, we can get a lot more production um, than if we have them competing. 
So with that, we tried uh, camelina lentils. We tried a, a relay crop. So we, we went in and seeded lentils into standing camelina. And uh, it worked okay. Camelina's pretty competitive. Again, if we were going to do this, we'd have to lower that first seeding rate, I think, a bit. But, but certainly in areas we did have, there was reasonable lentils. And if this was just as a soil type of thing and we were going to ignore it, that's fine. Um, as I kind of mentioned earlier, I had a focus. I guess I'm, I'm kind of a greedy farmer. I like my crops to, I like to be able to sell them. So I didn't want to just have these there for the good of the land, which, which probably was a good thing. But uh, we didn't really harvest a lot off of this. So the next time we tried putting them in the same time as the camelina and found that to be much better for us, actually, timing-wise. Um, it just, they didn't get out-competed. They grew exceptionally well together. Um, as, our, as they mentioned, uh, with three farmers, we do sell camelina oil, so we're aware of the quality of the oil and, and the rest of it. We're always doing um, chemical lab analysis on it for the oil profile, chemistry, that type of thing. When we intercropped, our quality was better as well, represented by the lab tests, and our oil yield was higher. So there were, there were some surprising factors that we saw, and we've actually changed our system to do that, and now that we're offering production contracts, uh, through that company for Camelina this year, we're actually offering them as intercrop contracts because of that quality benefit from it. Uh, there's also a benefit, mechanical benefit. So for harvest, Camelina is extremely tough to harvest because of these little pods, you can't break these. So the pods break in half and then they're pretty much indestructible. You can't shatter them no matter how aggressive you get with your combine. And then these little pods and the seeds are so tiny and lightweight that they just basically, as they're sifting on the pan, they keep catching seeds and carrying them up and you can't get a separation. When you grow lentils with it, this is a sample out of the combine, there's no pods anymore. Because the lentils sift down, they're heavy enough, they sift through those pods and they take the camelina seed with them. And so you can get a separation on your grain pan that you can't get with camelina. So our harvest speeds were probably two miles an hour faster and the losses out the back of the machine were much lower. Here's some lentil plants. These two were from a um, canola lentil crop. They were about six feet apart. The difference here is along the edge of a pasture, the gophers came out and they ate all the canola where this lentil plant was growing. Where this one's growing, this is just six feet over where they didn't eat the canola. So these crops will really change their growth habits. They change a lot of, a lot of aspects of how they will grow and how they will produce. We've seen lentil plants that are poking out the top of canola canopies. So you'll see lentil flowers coming out the top. Um, and they'll just stand up and they're stringy little things and you count them and they have 12 leaves and 10 pods. Um, they're really elastic little plants and they're, I really like using them in intercrops as well because the more you stress them, the more they just try and set seed. So it's amazing, they have very few leaves, they use very little sunlight, they use very little moisture and all they do is set seed. So they work really well in, in mixed crops. And obviously, one problem combining them is the lowest pods are right down here. The lowest pods are, are right there. So it makes harvest much easier. We went from, we used to swath lentils at probably two and a half miles an hour. And if we want to swath these intercrops, most of the time we straight cut them. But if we want to swath them, we're cutting them at six or seven miles an hour now. Because there's no worry, no worry about ground clearance. Here's corn and soybeans. Uh, it's another mix I really like growing together. They, they really perform well. Um, in fact, we've seen better soybean yields with corn than we get on, in a monoculture. On the first year we did them, we measured the two side by side and they were, they were superior yield with the corn. Some of the theory we've come up with later on that, uh, talking with other research, was they were talking about a carbon dioxide effect. So they were saying the corn canopy is essentially holding uh, carbon, carbon dioxide down near the plant. So it's like a greenhouse situation with increased carbon dioxide increasing that production of soybean. I don't know if I've... Uh, it sounds plausible, I guess that's what we're going with is some of the reason why that happens. Um, some of the other reason is probably AM fungi associating, the plants can tie together and share some nutrients and share some resources that way, get a better root mass. Um, yeah, just, just share their resources and do better. Harvesting them is, a, well harvesting is easy, separating is a challenge, corn and soybeans. Um, so we've, we've done different things with it in marketing, whether we sell them as a mix into livestock feed, they, they make a really good balanced ration, but uh, it's a little trickier to market, obviously. We've done some separations. Uh, what we're trying to find right now is a soybean seed that's a little bit smaller so that we can get the separation. If we can get it to fall through a 13 round, we probably can do a decent separation. 
So that's what we're working towards right now. The nice thing is I've got no specialty corn equipment, but by seeding them together, we can do a, a reasonable job through a regular air drill, and uh, we can also harvest them with a, with a flex draper, or this is just a flex header in the, in the picture here, but uh, either way works, because normally with a draper header harvesting corn, the corn cobs will fall on the draper and then they roll off and they fall on the ground. But if you have flax or soybeans or that type of thing, it acts like a broom, and so when those corn cobs fall off, the rest of the canopy just keeps pulling them in so they all go in the machine. So your losses are, are negligible and you can put the entire crop through. Um, this is the one exception, flax and chickpeas, to, I mentioned before, we've really come to putting all our crops together. Flax and chickpeas is the exception, and the reason why we do it in, we like to do paired alternate rows, so there's two rows of one and then two rows of the other. The reason for that is chickpeas are, are really disease prone and so ascochyta spreads through chickpeas like wildfire and uh, so we try and actually build a firewall out of the flax to stop the spread of disease. So we're stopping the contact from one plant to the other. So it's a designed intentional effort. In this picture you can see the one on the left here, there's, there's ascochyta. It's, there's uh, a number of spots on those leaves. This plant is just the next row over. So two feet over, that's the next plant. And this is actually to the southeast, that row. So it's even with the dominant wind. So normally you'd find a disease spot in the field and then there'd be this long elliptical circle with the wind showing the travel of that disease and it's spreading from there. We've been able to stop the spread. So this is more than just one spot on a leaf. It's, it's fairly infected in that plant. And the one two feet over really has next to nothing. So that's cut our fungicide use on, in a flax chickpea intercrop. To most years, we don't spray it at all for fungicide. Um, on really wet years, we'll, we've done one pass in the past. So normally, when a guy in a monoculture is doing his fourth pass, we'll start looking and seeing if we need to do our first. So it's been a huge savings for us. This is pea canola lentil. Um, we, had a, we ran out of canola in the tank, I guess, and our cedar operator didn't notice. So you can see here where the canola is, and it was only two pounds of canola in this case. And on this side, where the tank was pretty well empty. There's the odd plant coming out, but the tank was empty. Right up here, you can see, I hope that's clear, but there's kochia. So it's a little bit of saline area up there, but you can see the line. Where the, where the canola is, there's no kochia. It was that extra competitive amount. Where there's no canola, I've got kochia. So, I'd rather have canola and be able to sell it than dealing with that green kosher weed there. So that was, it was pretty eye-opening, a definite direct line there. So what is the next step? It makes sense, it, uh, it makes environmental sense, it makes sense from a point of view of managing the problems we're managing. What are we moving on to on our farm from, this basic, from the basic rates that I talked about? I um, mean, we're still advancing to the next thing. When we take a look at nature again, we'll see that there's not the same plants here as there is here and not the same up here. There's different plants depending on the soil, the water, and the topography. So just like in the US, they're, doing, they're talking multi-hybrid planting and they change their variety by, by landscape to suit that area of the field better, which makes sense, but it's still corn and it's still corn and it's still corn, so it's only so different. But if we have the ability to actually change the plant, now we can make big, big differences. I mean, a chickpea plant grows in a completely different environment than a soybean plant. So um, if you say that you're in too wet of an area to grow lentils or chickpeas, are your hilltops too wet? I know when we look at research on our farm, we take these maps and we'll take our higher areas here, our high dry spots, and we'll, we'll look at research farm from swift current and areas where it's dry and we say, okay, what are they doing? What are they managing? What crops grow? What rates? What fertilizer rates? What yields? Um, you know, and, and we treat those areas as if they're a dry area. And then we take our good low spots and we treat them as if we uh, are in Manitoba here, so where we have moisture and, and soil depth and those type of things. Phosphorus availability, all those, all those wonderful things. So that's what we try and manage like in those areas. Um, here's a, just a shot from above again, and as we talk about sunlight use efficiency, we can just see how dense that is and how the spaces all get filled in between pea, canola, and lentil. Um, and it's been a really good mix for us. We've been varying the lentils onto those hilltop high areas and the peas more in the low spots and then the canola across the board. Um, saline areas will really boost the canola rate because it's more saline tolerant, that type of thing. 
Here's a shot from the side as we were harvesting and you can just see each plant has its uh, kind of layer in there. The lentils are all growing up down in here and there's lots of pods down in there of lentils. And so, uh, but it's very dense. You can't see very far into this canopy. It's, it's black. So nothing else is coming. None of these late flushes of weeds that you can get after canola drops its leaves and then you get a rain, you can start to get some green growth. Not in this case, it's, it's dense and it's full. Um, we've been able to straight cut, so we're growing, we're not buying high priced canola seed anymore because the genetics are geared for monoculture and high yields. I don't care so much about the yield potential because every less bushel of canola I get is just an extra bushel of peas or lentils. So uh, it's all a trade off. So instead we save money on seed cost. We're using uh, the old open pollinated clear field varieties. Uh, we switched last year mostly to mustards actually. Went back into mustard, just the market dictated. But it lets us straight cut even those old varieties because they get tangled up with the peas and so they're not shattering the same. They're, they're held in place just like they would be in a swath. So we find they, they really do well standing up and lets us straight cut them which saves. This shot is from more of a hilltop area so the lentil population is higher in this sample. The next one the peas are a little higher so it varies as you go. But both samples you can see you're able to clean up the sample very well in the combine. You're not taking a lot of trash or anything else. You open the sieves. Most of it's thrashed in the feeder house and you just turn up your fan until the trash disappears. Very simple to set the combine, uh, does a really nice job. Extremely heavy mix though, um, you want to watch on your trucks, you'll overload them very quickly. The canola fills in the spaces between them and it makes a very, very heavy crop coming off the field. So um, some of the other things that we're starting to work towards now on our farm and look at and think about is that always live and growing. So that green cover and that green bridge and keeping things alive on the fields at all time is what we're striving to do. And I'm trying to do that in a manner, as I mentioned before, I've always got to focus. I don't like spending $30 an acre on cover crop seed to just watch it grow this tall and say that looks really cool and then it freezes and I hope it did something for me. I always struggle with that. I want to get use out of them. I want to get uh, an additional benefit besides. So I was excited to hear when, when she was talking about grazing in the systems and that's some of what we've been experimenting with too. And that's where we found uh, turnips is one that we've really decided that we, we quite like and the cattle seem to just love them. Um, they'll go and dig them out and they prefer them to the corn even. We found this year. So, so under the corn and soybeans we did, uh, we did a vetch and a rye and clover was in there and turnips. And most of them didn't do much. The rye was good because we wanted to go back in there in the spring. And so just the root mass of the rye makes the ground a little more stable so the cattle don't punch the soil out as much in the spring. It also gave a little bit of green growth in the spring which made them kind of wander out and, and try and find every green blade they can. And while they're wandering around, they pick up the rest of the corn that they left or the, you know, the other plant material. So that was beneficial for two factors is getting the ground stable and enticing them to go out. Uh, when we combine the corn and soybeans over top of the turnips and rye and all the rest of it, we created some interesting problems. Uh, the green turnip leaves were plugging the return on my combine, so I had sent out a tweet that said, is anyone else having trouble with green growth of turnips plugging their return when combining corn and soybeans? <laughs> Leanne Minogue said that might be just me. So, but it was an interesting crop. Um, and as I mentioned, the cattle absolutely loved it. We had a lot of snow cover on it. So at first it took them a little while to figure out the turnips and then in a couple of days they were gone in the fall and then any of the stuff that we put them into in the winter, they weren't able to totally find those soybeans and, and turnips that were in the bottom but they went and picked the corn and as I mentioned when they went back out in the spring they went back out and they found all those turnips and, and the rest of the soybeans and they did a real good job of cleaning up in the spring. Um, this year when we've got no snow cover they were finding those turnips all out into December and digging them up and, and actually we put them onto a piece that didn't have the turnips after we got, after that was all used up and they walked out there and then they walked back and they walked out there <laughs> then they walked back and we watched them go back and forth all day um, and that's all we could think of is they were just looking for those turnips so and we watched them the first day in there this year after they knew what those plants were they would walk past corn and, and pick those out of the ground so so and, and we really like them because they don't compete with the other crop. You can put them in in you know late June type of thing and get a very big plant, even July, and still get a very big turnip, big plant growth, and it doesn't compete with the crop because of that staging again, as I mentioned with the corn and flax. The other crop 
your main cash crop is pretty well done already. So if you can get these seeded in after, you're not losing any yield from your main crop and you can still get the secondary one plus the benefits of cycling nutrients. So logistics, um, how do we make all this happen? So that's always the challenge. The next guy says, okay, so now at this point, everyone says, okay, this is wonderful, makes sense, that's great for you, but I can't do it because whatever reason. So this is what we then started moving towards on our farm was to be able to totally control everything down to the square foot, carry six products, do all of this. But um, where there's a will, there's a way. You can figure out how to get multiple products to one point in one pass if you need to. This is how we started. The first intercropping we did, we had a, a machine like this in 2004. So we had four, four tanks, very inexpensive machine, uh, on the go inoculating so we could run the products through we wanted and inoculate them as we seeded. We managed to do it. We can block hoses, you know, it's just plumbing. Turn valves on and off, move hoses here and there so the products go where you want them to go. Had to be done in one pass. Combining, no modifications required at harvest. Um, as I mentioned, in, in many cases, it actually makes the actual combine run smoother. If you've got the right combinations, it actually was, was a benefit. Um, swathing can be easier, straight cutting is easier, uh, combine settings are easier. All that was not a problem. Separating, again, there's a number of ways to do it. This is not the fastest way. This is the way we started. We just bought an inexpensive, large drum. Um, as opposed to a quick clean or something because the quick clean was hard on the peas with the augers and that type of thing. Um, whereas this was high capacity for both products, uh, inexpensive, just tumbled it around. It took a little bit of setup when you fill the bin, uh, but we've got enough conveyors in there, we could move one to the next bin or the next bin or whatever, and it, it worked. It was a little bit of fooling around, switching bins, but otherwise not too bad. We did it all while we combined so it didn't turn into a chore that you re regretted all winter where you're standing at a grain cleaner all winter. But as we got bigger and did more and more of our acres, uh, you know, we're around half to two thirds of our acres are intercropped every year. So we've got a lot of product to put through a cleaner. We started wearing this one out. Screens didn't last that long. So we decided we were committed to this and we invested in a grain handling system we've been setting up and improving that. We, we got a large market cleaner air and screen machine that can separate three products. So for our three products, we can go three directions on the go. We've now put it overhead. So we were going this way and this way to the circle and then dropping our third product to a trailer. And uh, now we're actually doing a new system for this fall that we're working on right now, putting in a leg so that we'll actually have three product capability on the go. So we can come dump in a pit and everything will automatically run through. Um, so that's, that's kind of my own interest, I guess, we like to automate things. So that's what we're trying to do to make it work. So let's talk about the dollars a little bit. Does it make sense economically? I told you that's the reason why I did it. So I guess I'll show you kind of the results from doing it. So this was in 2016, these are the numbers. Um, this year was really dry, but th these numbers are from 16. So canola crop, we didn't grow any monoculture canola. That's out of our crop options now. We don't even look at it anymore, but in the area, guys were getting 40 bushels an acre of canola. So at what I figured my costs were for that crop, that would have netted $50 an acre. Not bad, a decent year if you can net $50 an acre after all your costs, labor included, that's, that's reasonable. Um, lentils, 2016 was a great year to grow lentils. Price was really good, quality was good. They netted $160 an acre. Um, good year to have them. Maple peas, same thing. Yields were strong, price is good, costs aren't as high as canola, so uh, it netted a very good return too. So 2016, guys growing monocultures, it was a great year. So how did we fare in this? Well, if we take a look first, the way that they scientifically, all the research you're gonna read is always focused on land equivalency ratios. So we grew 13 bushel an acre of canola instead of 40, so that's 32%. Peas, we grew 25 instead of 40, so that's 62 and we got seven bushels of lentils out of the mixture, so that was 30% of a lentil crop. So our land equivalency ratio is 1.25. That's okay, not bad, right? That's what the research kind of shows, commonly can get 25% extra yield. What does that mean? More than double the net profit. When you punch those numbers in, our costs were lower because we used, um, we didn't use expensive canola seed, so that was a big savings. Our fertilizer costs, our nitrogen costs in particular were lower because we had the mixture. Our fungicide costs were non-existent. So our passes were less. Um, and our yield was about 45 instead of 40. 
And uh, in the end, it grossed more money and the costs were lower, so it was $250 an acre profit, $136 better than the monocultures. So it was huge. I mean, that 25% doesn't sound that dramatic. That's huge. So, I mean, even on normal years, when, you, when you're at a break-even or loss situation, it can be the difference between a very good year with a healthy profit versus, um, versus losing money. So why doesn't everybody do this if it really is that amazing and that dramatic? Because there's nothing to sell you. There's nothing, and maybe I'm being cynical again, but honestly, it's up to us as business owners to do this part of the work. Nobody's going to stand at the booth. I, I'm not renting a booth at Ag Days to stand here and try and sell you seeding rates and seeding timings and intercropping because there's nothing there. So nothing happens until someone sells something. So I think for next year, <laughs> anyone that wants to intercrop, here we go. Um, got some magic spray here. It's, and it is certified organic, by the way. So, so we're good. Anyone can talk to me and, and we can uh, lower your input costs, reduce your fertilizer, and make you more money. Um, is there any questions? How much is this? Four fifty an acre. <laughs> yep. What are the challenges of, of getting these different crops to mature at the same time? Um, Again, that's thought in the design process. So first we'll select, like we've been using maple peas, which are a little later maturing pea than regular varieties. And then we choose early maturing canola varieties in general. The other thing is keeping in mind which crop is going to be mature first. Is it a grade sensitive crop? So red lentils, they're almost bulletproof. Flax is almost bulletproof, right? They can stand there forever. No downgrading, no yield loss, no shattering risk, that type of thing. So your risky crop, if you've got one you're worried about shattering, worried about quality, that has to be the limiting, that has to be the later one. So it's about designing those, right? So certainly my red lentils in the pea canola lentil, the lentils are mature and dry um, probably a week or two before the rest of the crop is ready. But it doesn't hurt them. They just stand underneath there and they're, they're tied up in the canopy and they'll sit and wait. Um, and then when the rest of the crop is ready, in we go. And same thing, the peas are usually ready a little bit before the canola, but same thing, they're not really shatter prone, they're, they're standing good, so they're not risking sprouting or any of that, they're standing because the canola is holding them up, and it just stands and waits. So that's been most of the focus. I wouldn't do a, a green lentil, I've been reluctant to do a green lentil because it'll probably bleach by the time I can get there to harvest it. So, uh, yes, right there. We've tried some cereals. Um, peas and barley was, was okay. Peas and malt barley. We tried uh, pea, canola, and barley. Uh, the cereals are, are a whole other layer of competitive over top of your other crops. Like flax grown with a pulse. Flax is dramatically more competitive than the pulse crop. So you have to take that into account with your seeding rates and whatever. So in flax chickpeas or flax lentils, our flax seeding rate is about 15 pounds per acre. And we make sure that we don't put much or any nitrogen there in the case of, of chickpeas and lentils and stuff because the flax will outcompete it. If we put flax with durum one year, it was the complete opposite. The durum will completely choke out and outcompete the flax. So the cereals are just that whole nother level higher and they've also been bred longer to, to be steered towards monoculture. And so we find they're not, I guess the biggest benefits come from the crops that have the most problems. Um, so like your pulse crops are still elastic and changing and we find even the old varieties like the old, uh, the old uh, not semi-leafless ones but the leafy types that used to grow really tall, they get way more pods on them. So in your pea crop when you see the leafy pea, there's still, you'll see a few of them in the peas all the time, right? And they always have way more pods on those plants. And, uh, but the reason you can't have your whole crop be that way is because they'd fall down and get diseased before they ever filled up and they'd die. So, but we found after about five or six generations of keeping our own seed, they migrated back to that because they were higher yielding. So in that situation, they performed better. Um, the cereals are so tough and resilient and competitive, we're struggling to find something that works well with them to give us that over yielding advantage. We 
so far I've found most of the time it's a trade-off. But we're going to play some more with them still in, now that we're doing variable rate. So we're going to play with them in those zones where we're having problems. Oh, sorry. No, we've, uh, our area crop insurance guarantees are so brutally low that we haven't even gone in it. But they do a calculation on you choose which crop and then they turn the other one into dollars and turn it into yield in that crop. So there is a way of doing it, but not, we haven't been in a system, no. Over here. Um, I guess probably the short answer is no. I mean, we do soil test everything regularly, but to say that there's a dramatic difference, it's such a moving target, right? One year nitrogen's here, next year it's depending on things that happen, so. Well, I think it's, it helps versus, I mean, it depends what you compare it to, right? We've also been, because of uh, economics, we've also been pushing our rotation so instead of being, you know, 50% cereals, we've kind of been pushing 60, 65% into the, into these mixed crops and less cereals. And, and so even a mixed crop, like certainly we get more, we get more organic matter and more soil organic carbon being generated from these mixed crops than we would from canola alone or from peas alone, uh, having a mix because we get more biomass, but not nearly as much as a barley or oat crop or or a cereal crop, right? Not nearly as many tons of stable straw. So, so yeah, it, it probably is better than had we done the monoculture, but, and especially with the, with the grazing ones underneath, that can, that can make a bigger impact because you're cycling that and leaving it there, so. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, reduced disease and insect pressures and uh, herbicide usage, yeah, as I mentioned through there for sure. We, I didn't have a slide up there. Flea beetles was one in a mixed crop. Um, flea beetles, I was told by an entomologist that, that they count to four basically. So a flea beetle will go from hop from plant to plant and if he finds a host plant, a brassica species that he wants to eat four times, then they stay there. If they don't, they keep going. And so we find that they move out of the field generally. Yeah. <laughs> Where it's treated seed and they die. So, so, so that works. I mean, um, but it, it just is the truth, I guess. So there's less pressure from that for sure. Disease, definitely flax and chickpeas, as I mentioned. We don't even think about a fungicide application until a monoculture is doing their fourth pass before we would even look at it. Um, and even then, sometimes not. Um, at the top. Flax and soybeans, yes, we did try them once. Um, it was not a successful one for us. We tried them with those, what do they call them, the natto soybean, I think, that small guy. We tried them with them because it was a higher value market. Um, we didn't have a lot of luck with it. And since we've kind of just moved away from soybeans, other than the only place I've put soybeans in the last couple of years is actually with our grazing corn. Um, Otherwise, we haven't really, I don't know, we just struggle with getting any soybean production that's economical in our area. Or I do, anyway. Yes? Yes, and the reason we've done them different timings and the same timing, I think it might be slightly better if you delay seeding the soybeans, but it's an extra pass and it's not nearly as dramatic as the flax because soybeans are slow to grow too. So at the time that the corn gets to its height where it's deciding its cob length and stuff, the soybeans aren't very big either. So they're not really creating a lot of stress except for where the plant might be right beside it. But otherwise it's, it's not creating big stress on it. So we've been able to plant them at the same time without seeing any real negative to that. But if you put in a crop like flax that's going to jump on top of it, then there's a problem. Yes, right above Um, with the turnips and stuff, we, we just broadcast that. Yeah, so we just, yeah, we broadcast that, yeah. Yeah, 
yeah, that's what we did. You could drill it and have better luck. We usually watch the forecast and as reliable as that is, but um, if you see some rain event coming and go out there and spread her on and cross your fingers. So, and if you have a good canopy, it actually helps to delay it until you've got enough canopy ground cover that you've got shading on the ground because then if you get that shower, it can stay wet on the surface. Whereas if you don't have that ground cover and you broadcast, you'll get a shower and germinate, but then it, the wind and the sun and it dries out and, and you don't have that emergence. So we've had better luck if you can delay until you get that shading to keep the soil wet, then that's a, we've had better success that way. Um, anything over here I've been neglecting? Um, we're doing them same row, yeah, and same thing, that, that's actually where the research came from where I was mentioning before when we tried the canola and peas in different rows. The research that I found showing the interaction of roots was done with corn and soybeans. Um, it was a research where they did, they planted the crops separately and they put a, so in the same spot in the field they dropped like a plexiglass window stopping any root exudates and everything from, from moving and grew the plants side by side so that they could say the above ground features were still the same. Then they grew it with a cheesecloth so that the roots couldn't interact, but they thought exudates and water and stuff could move back and forth. And then they grew it with the roots actually interacting. And, and it took the roots actually growing in close proximity to make the advantage. That was most of the advantage. There was some advantage to the above ground um, complements of each other, but most of the advantage was from that root interaction. So we've gone and stuck with same rows with the exception of flax and chickpeas because we want the the disease firewall. Otherwise we mix them. Yes? What's that, sorry? Yeah, the top is above, um, as I showed you, some of it, when we, when we harvest the corn and soybeans over top of them, we actually cut them off just about at the ground. The header's bumping over top of the turnips as it kind of goes, so it's clipping the tops right off. Um, turnips are mostly on top of the ground, like they're, they're kind of like a little rock there, so they, they'll actually hollow them out. I should have put that slide in from this winter. When they were frozen in the ground, you can see they just, they just chew them right out with their bottom jaw and hollow them out in the ground. So they'll get at them for sure. And they do like the tops too, like if you can, if you do it in a different crop where you can let that top regrow, like we're going to try some in barley this year, so we'll combine the barley really early and then, and then the turnips will have a chance to grow and they'll like that. They like those leaves too and they stay green way out into December. Like they're, they're still green leaves there. So, the top. Weed control with these mixtures aside from the seeding rate? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the weed control in the mixtures certainly, I mean, the biggest tool, and you guys as organic farmers, I mean, this is where, I mean, there's a lot of good agronomic, basic agronomic knowledge and research that comes from organic research because. Um, because, like I said, you don't have these fallback tools, right? Everything else, I was in Saskatoon and there was a, pres or I wasn't there, I was on Twitter, there was a presentation that guys were tweeting about that was down the slide said integrated pest management at the top and it was all about how to seed and, and stuff so that your timing was right for fungicide application. I'm like, that's not integrated pest management, that's <laughs> just trying to use the one tool, right? And so, certainly the, the basics that you guys have, like, your seeding rates and your timings and stuff, those are the big tools that sort of mean that to make it so that you don't need those herbicide options at all, right? So you have to understand which weeds you're battling, when they're going to come, do you wait for them or do you try to get ahead of them, right? So same as I've learned with the corn and flax, there's stages. So if you know the, the weed spectrum and you know what you're dealing with, you can gear your crop, either your crop choices or your crop timings, so that you're going to be able to choke that guy out at the time when it needs something, right? So, I mean, everybody knows if wild oats are ahead of your crop, they're devastating. If they're behind your crop, they don't have as much yield impact. So it's all in that timing and rates. And certainly your seeding rates, the optimum seeding rate when you mix crops is higher than if it was a, a monocrop because you don't create those problems of lodging or disease or other things that stop you on your seeding rate otherwise. 
So those are, are big tools that all work in your favor and, and you can take them even further than you are right now if you mix the crops. And then even putting, like we are putting the crops in certain areas. So we know the lentils are going to struggle if I put them in a low spot. They're going to get diseased. I mean, that's why there aren't many lentils and chickpeas grown out here, because it's too wet. Right? So I know my low spots are going to be too wet. They're not going to work well. So putting them where they're going to work and, and timing things up so that you can compete with what you're trying to compete with. So you have to be really smart about it. Any other questions? benefit from having the cattle on the fields? Yeah, I think so. Um, certainly everybody knows that, I mean, the, the field that you can find, the old yard sites where it used to be the old pasture, where they took the manure spreader out every year, I mean, even if it was 40 years ago, you'll still see those spots today. It's still dramatically better. Now, why is that better? I mean, I think it's soil biology. Now, that's kind of an area that I certainly don't know enough about, and I don't even think that in general, that we in general know enough about soil biology yet, and I think there's still a lot of learning to be done there, but there, there's definitely something there to the cycling and the animals in that cycle that are creating a benefit. Now, if I take certainly my winter grazing stuff where I grow the crop for the full intention, I don't harvest or remove anything, I'd put it all through the animals and cycle it back. I mean, that's, that to me is, is the gold standard of green manure. Um, instead of just plowing it down, I'm actually cycling it through an animal and biologically turning that into a, into a manure. That's definitely superior than just putting the organic matter in, in my opinion. Yeah. Well, it, it doesn't take much. Um, like we've got, if I go back to the maps, um, my friends at CropPro did the mapping for me, which won an innovation award here this year, so I guess they're validated in Manitoba now. But they, they map the fields based on soil, water, and topography. And so once you've got this map once, that's it, it's done. There's no heavy research to do behind it. Now, I mean, I'll do soil tests and plan fertility here, but even aside from that, for my seeding rates, I don't even need testing year over year. All I do is I take my file here and I'm going to say, I know that I'm going to put lentils, a higher population of lentils in this area, and I'm going to put more peas down in, in these lower spots here. Do you travel No, a variable rate equipment on the drills. Yeah, and so you just program in your prescription. Uh, it takes... I mean, I've got the software and stuff. I mean, certainly the consultants will do that for you and write prescriptions. I do them on my own, so I'll just, in five minutes, when I'm doing the previous field and the auto steer is on, I'll write the prescription for the next field and... Yeah, yeah, and it automatically changes all the rates as you go, so... Yes. Yes, so the question was, if you put the same mix everywhere, will it automatically sort of migrate towards the crop that's going to be favored? And the answer is yes, it will. Um, but sometimes these seed costs are higher, and so I can help it along. I know if I put, and the first years we did, pea, canola, lentil, we just did half the seeding rate of each across the board, and it was good. It worked well, but we still knew that the lentils in this area weren't doing well for us, and the peas in this area, they weren't growing very tall and being very productive. So... So we just biased that seeding rate, saved a little money on seed and probably get a little bit of boost by having a few more lentils where they're going to do well and a few more peas where they're going to do well. So it's just incremental gains. But if you don't have a variable rate equipment, that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it at all. Certainly there's still the, the bulk of the gain. It's all diminishing returns. The bulk of the gain is by putting all the different plants there and then a little less return from steering it even better. Over here is... Yes? Maybe the last Um, okay, the question was when, when the one crop starts to die and mature, does it send out signals or, or bleed off and, 
and send signals to the other one to mature. I don't know the answer to that and I don't know of any research that's been done on that. Um, certainly maturities do change, I would say, when they're mixed versus not. Um, that's been a benefit to the flax chickpeas as well as it, it definitely accelerates the maturity of the chickpeas. Now I don't know if that's because the flax takes the moisture out late in the season and dries the soil down a little more to accelerate the maturity or if there's some type of signal, I'm not sure, but it does, it does accelerate the maturity on the chickpeas. Yeah, I would say they are slightly different. Yeah. In most cases I've seen, yeah, I haven't seen where I would say it took longer or was, was detrimental to me, but only flax and chickpeas I've definitely noticed an advantage where it came in earlier. Uh, corn and soybeans actually as well was earlier for sure, because we had corn by itself side by side and it was about a week earlier with the soybeans. And it probably was due to the fact that it was a thinner population with the soybeans. So as you seed corn at a lighter rate, it matures earlier. It's kind of backwards to what our other cereals would be. So, but it's because it can get more sunlight, I guess, and it needs those heat units to mature. Thanks for tuning in to the Manitoba Ag Days podcast. We'll see you next year from January 22nd to 24th, 2019.